Welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, created and hosted by Scott Knudsen, to explore the crossroads of horses and business. Now here's your host, Scott Knudsen. Hi, and welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're listening to us on KCAA, the NBC affiliate out in California, or if you're watching our podcast on one of our many platforms, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. So today we have a dear friend of mine, Keith Thane is on the show. We met in Dillon, Montana about a year or so ago. Keith is a senior director of the Equine Protection Program for the Humane Society for the United States. Keith, thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, uh, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to it ever since we were in Dillon together for the Montana Center for Horsemanship event. Um, we, we were on the stage together and uh, I uh, appreciate everything you do. Thanks so much. Well, you did a great job moderating that panel, and I really enjoyed it. And I've been looking forward to getting together again with you virtually here for quite a while. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. So so where did it start for you with horses? Did, was it um, as a child, or when did your passion for the horse industry begin? Yeah, it really was as a young teen. Uh, and I'm going <laughs> to myself here, but it's over 40 years ago now. I've been in the horse industry for over four decades. But um, my junior high school had a, a riding program, an after school riding program, and I got into riding and never looked back. I've been involved all that time and, you know, not just pleasure riding, but as a judge, as a, a breeder of horses, um, owner amateur trainer, and um, just have really enjoyed a long life in, uh, in the horse industry. Man, that's wonderful. It's amazing how fast time flies. You know, when you're in the industry you love, you know, and you turn around, you're like, where'd they go? But uh, you do so much. I can't wait to kind of unpack all that and go through it because I know people are going to love hearing about it. So uh, did you go to school for this, like at, at college or where did you go to college? No, I didn't go to school for, um, you know, equestrian sports or husbandry or anything. It's all been just learning through those those decades, um, you know, trial and error and learning from others uh, in the industry, but I went to school for, at SUNY Albany in uh, Albany, New York for um, political science and history. And then I went on to get a master's degree in computer science at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And I put that um, skill to work for several years working in IT for Kaiser Permanente. But you know, my passion being horses, I really wanted to find a way to to make that my livelihood. And, you know, I think if you're doing something you love, it's it's not like work, right? So, um, you know, over the years, uh, did get involved in more in the horse industry, as I said, as a breeder and trainer, amateur owner trainer, and had a boarding stable for several years um, in Maryland and had a, you know, great um, network of friends and fellow equestrians there that, uh, you know, I still consider lifelong friends today. That's so awesome. I, I love the part about being an entrepreneur too, you know, when, inside and outside the industry. And, and so, so for the audience, maybe what, what, what is, are they similar being inside and outside the industry? Um, because you, you did real estate, you do real estate and you, you're an investor and, and, and you're also in the equine. So how, how did you, did you learn from each other, each one of the um, different groups or how did you do that? Well, um, you know, real estate is a pretty specialized business. And uh -huh. um, yeah, and so I bought and sold some properties, some horse farms, uh, and eventually <laughs> moved to Hawaii, which I know we're going to talk about, and yeah. had a horse farm here for several years. But, uh, you know, I think just learning from other peers in the industry about, um, you know, breeding techniques and um, husbandry and things like that. You learn, you learn a lot over the, all those years and getting to know so many different people. So, you know, going to conferences, attending seminars and now webinars, right? Yeah. Those absolutely. didn't exist when I first started, but a lot of, yeah. a lot of information to be gained by those today. Man, I love that because you're, you're, you're outside the industry a little bit in the teenage years you found, I want to do that. And then you created right. your path and I love that. And then you, within your own entrepreneur business, you, you found a way to, get in the stay in the horse business so yes. there's a lot of people that want to do that I appreciate you saying that because you know they're, they might be in a job they don't like and 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 transitioning over is tough sometimes you know so but it can't be done that's right that's right well and of course um 
I know we'll talk about this more, but I grew up in the Tennessee walking horse industry. So I saw a lot of abuses and things um, and really became a passion of mine to try to remedy those things, to turn them around. And so working from within the industry and now in my current role, um, I think we've really made a lot of progress in uh, protecting those horses and making sure that uh, they're treated humanely. I love that's, that. So, so explain to the audience, what is a Tennessee walking horse? Sure. Well, the walking horse was a breed, is a breed that was um, formulated back in the you know, 1900s, early 1900s. Um, it was meant to carry plantation owners long distances um, you know, on their plantations down south. And they developed a breed that could do a four beat gait. It doesn't trot or pace. So it's not a lateral or diagonal, it's a four beat. So each leg moves independently. It creates a really smooth riding gait. And that's the first you know, breed of horse that I fell in love with. It's the one that I've been involved with my entire life really, uh, primarily. And um, unfortunately back in the you know, mid uh, 20th century, they started uh, abusing the horses to try to get them to perform an unnatural gait for the show ring, which um, led to, actually to the passage of a federal law back in 1970 called the Horse Protection Act that was intended to end the practice known as soaring. That's right. what we call the, the abuse that these horses suffer. So um, I've been involved in the formation of groups, uh, national groups that were dedicated to the promotion and protection of the sound, what we call flat shod. Uh, natural Tennessee walking horse. And, uh, you know, we've had a, a, a big show circuit at one point going, uh, providing a place for people who wanted to uh, have a level playing field and show their horses humanely and have com camaraderie and not be breaking the law, right? Um, and we created that. And, uh, you know, there are several show circuits like that today. So that was sort of a model for, for what uh, is going on today. Very cool, man. Very cool. You got to be proud looking back on that and making a difference within the industry for the horse because we're all here because we love horses. You know, we love business, but we love the horse. And, and uh, that's got to make you feel great. It really does. I mean, it's been very rewarding and, and gratifying to see the progress that we've made. We're not there yet. There's still abuses going on and we've got some more work to do. But, um, you know, there's been great progress made. And, you know, the thing is, this is a, uh, an issue that the entire horse industry cares about. You know, the American Horse Council, USEF, just about every segment of the industry is with us on this and, and wants to see this end because it's, it doesn't just impact the walking horse breed, it impacts the whole horse industry. When people hear about abuses or you know, cruelties, they don't want to be involved with something that allows that. And so that's why the horse industry really wants to help end this, this practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. American Horse Council does so many great things. Yes, um, they really do. They really do. So so being an owner and a trainer, what do you so there's people that love being an owner of a horse, some people that want to be a trainer of a horse. What did you think was the most uh, the most difficult? That's a good question. I think, um, you know, not coming from a professional training background, just learning the ropes, learning the techniques and learning what's effective and what's not and what's humane and what's not. And, you know, with walking horses, they don't all just come out of their mamas doing that natural gait immediately. Sometimes they need some, you know, guidance and there's ways to do that humanely and bring out the best gait in them. So that was, you know, that was a learning experience, but I got pretty good at it over time. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you also had the, the um, a stable so so people i guess would rent space there right for their horse so so if you're not yeah. watching that's pretty much what it is correct right right well, we were lucky enough to live on a county park um, in maryland and had some great riding trails and um, we had a small place but we had about you know, five or six um stalls for for rent and uh had a great group of people as boarders and uh, really enjoyed having them there and um, you know, that's a, a small business in and of itself, right? So you got to know Absolutely. Uh, not only zoning things and things like that, but just how to, how to make it profitable. Absolutely. So what is, um, there's, there's so many people that have that or want to do that because that's their passion to have horses on the place and let it pay for itself. Um, so when, when, uh, one piece of advice you can give somebody that wants to do that or is doing that. Liability insurance. <laughs> Seriously. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. You got to protect yourself. Yeah. Start with that's great. I mean, there's so many people that don't and, and it's uh, you kind of get scary sometimes. So I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, accidents happen, but you know, you can be held responsible for anything, even though some states have laws that say that, you know, when you participate in an equestrian activity, there is no liability. That doesn't mean somebody can't sue you. And even if they don't win, you could still, you know, rack up some legal fees. So I'm a strong proponent of uh, liability insurance. Yeah, that's that's great advice. That's great advice. So so doing everything you did in all your entrepreneur jobs, how did you find or did they find you the Humane Society of the United States? Well, living close to Washington, D.C., I became sort of a grassroots advocate on the soaring issue and several other you know, horse protection issues and would do some lobbying with um, what now our colleagues at HSUS, at the Humane Society of the United States, and um, learned that they were starting up an equine protection program. I applied for the job and got it. And awesome. That was over 15 years ago, and I think we made a lot of progress, a lot of headway, and uh, really grateful for the opportunity because they're a great organization. Um, they do so much good, not just advocacy, you know, public policy, but rescue. And, you know, we mentioned um, the rat ranch down in um, Texas, Black Beauty Ranch, that's one of the largest equine sanctuaries in the United States. So just an honor to be a part of them and um, you know, be able to do good work for horses. Absolutely. That's a cool story. It's so cool that you can office in Washington, D.C., but yet live in Hawaii. Yes. That's like everybody's dream right there. That's so cool. I started doing this even before COVID. It's been about six years now. Um, and over the years, uh, our organization has become more disparate in terms of people being able to work where they want to you know, live, where they want to live and work from there remotely. And COVID really did that for everybody, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, You're just ahead of it. Going to our, very few people are going into our offices right now and they'll, they'll return eventually, but it's just shown that with Zoom and, you know, um, internet connections, we can pretty much work from everywhere or uh -huh. anywhere we want. And uh, I still make quite a few trips back to the mainland uh, for conferences. I'm going to be going to the American Horse Publications Conference, uh, which we're a sponsor of and have been for several years uh, awesome. in May. Another great I'm group. Back at that Dillon, Montana event in September and a few other things throughout the year. So, so there's uh, a so lot of, tra there's still some travel involved for you. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, that was pretty non-existent during the first 18 months or so of COVID, but things have started to open up again. And uh, awesome. yeah, I'll be I'll be on the road, so to speak. That That's awesome, man. That, that's great. You know, and it's always good, you know, when you're there for some events and, and get to shake hands and say hello and in person. It makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to have a presence at uh, Equine Affair in Columbus. I won't be there, but my colleague will be there. And yeah. Awesome. Um, a few other events throughout the year. Scott will be right back with more. Hi, I'm Scott Knutson, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Today, we're going to talk about something I'm really passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. Those that don't, now you know I do. And we've been working on this for several months, and we, we wanted to get it just right. And we don't put our name on anything unless we feel 100% certain it's, it's the best product we can get. And uh, we, we've done it. I really believe we've done it. We've created a coffee line, 13 great flavors. I'm gonna show you three of them. We have K-Cups in all 13 flavors. Here's a Jamaican Me Crazy. It's a, just a really great coffee. Everyone has great logos. It has a brand, the same brand that's on our horses, our trailers. You know that brand means something and we wouldn't put it on here if it wasn't good coffee. We have whole bean. This is a great Honduran blend and uh, it's a whole bean coffee. We have whole bean in all 13 flavors. And then we have a ground coffee. Uh, this is a really great one. My wife and I really like this a lot, loved it. So we named it after our daughter, Hades Glenn. Everyone has the packaging and the logo of the show, our brand, and I hope you like it. I, I really believe you will. And we're gonna have more flavors coming out soon. We're gonna have the pumpkin spices and then we're gonna go to peppermint after that. And please send us your suggestions as well. You can find it at cowboyentrepreneur.shop. Think coffee shop, cowboyentrepreneur.shop. Thank you so much. So what's your experience like with the Humane Society and being in, in your passion part of the Humane Society and the equine protection part? What, what's that like waking up and just saying, I get to do what I love? 
Mm -hmm. well, as I said, it's really rewarding. Um, I, have to, I feel like we've made a lot of progress on a number of issues. We've still got a ways to go, but um, you know, back in 2020, we were successful in getting the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act passed and signed into law by then President Trump. And um, it takes a lot to get federal laws passed, particularly animal protection laws, especially with everything else going on in the world, right, and in our country. Sure. So uh, when you can get a, a major bill like that um, passed, it's very rewarding. And you know, we've got a couple of other bills that we're working to get passed, and I know we will. We'll just stay at it until we yeah. do. Uh, that horse racing bill is going to really it has the potential to save a lot of equine lives by reining in the the doping in the racing industry and you know putting oversight over that under one um, national entity rather than 38 different individual racing jurisdictions in the 38 states that have racing so um that's just one example of the progress that i think we've made i mean uh we um did a huge project here in hawaii even before i lived here before I moved here to rescue over 600 feral donkeys uh, that were at risk of you know, being eradicated and uh, were able to home all of them, uh, most of them here in Hawaii, but some of them on the mainland as well. We had uh, several donors that um, supported uh, that project and uh, we flew a 747 a livestock 747 flight with about 200 donkeys to California and we homed them out there. So um, that was a really rewarding experience, you know, hands-on, you know, feel good. You know, you were saving uh, a whole large herd of animals that could have been wiped out. So. so so, let's talk about that. That's such a cool story. So so, where was that in Hawaii? On the big island, there's a village um, called Waikoloa Village. And they actually own about, I guess, 10,000 or so acres that they um, hadn't developed yet. And they were leasing out to a cattle rancher. Well, on this land, there were also these six or so hundred um, donkeys, and there was a drought that hit the big island of Hawaii, and there was consequently little forage, little uh, water available, natural sources of water. And so the rancher was having to bring in hay and water for his cattle, and donkeys were competing with him. Uh, you know, for the forage and water, and they were also breaking out of the fences and getting into roadways and getting hit and going on to the local golf course and grazing on the golf course. So something had to be done. And, uh, you know, they're trapping them and containing them. But it was just the population was growing, even though the resources were shrinking. And so they contacted the Humane Society of the United States and said, you know, we really would love to not have to do some lethal means of control. Um, can you help us? And so we put together a project where a local veterinarian, Brady Bergen, um, was instrumental in the project and helped us with the help of the rancher um, round up all those donkeys and you know he by by and large he and a, a couple of veterinarians that flew in from California did a huge um, neuter effort um, to, to castrate all the males and you know check them all for lice and things like that and then get them ready to be adopted um, you know, wow. put some handling on them and um, it was about a year and a half long project, but in the end, all those donkeys found great homes and uh, we didn't lose any of them. Oh, that, that's amazing. That's such a great story. So uh, I'm trying to envision 200 donkeys on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, what, what did y'all do special for that? You know, how did you get them in there and what, what was uh, the premise? Well, the, the, you know, there's a lot of livestock transport between Hawaii and particularly the Hawaii Island, the mainland, because we have one of the largest cattle ranches in the United States here on the Big Island, Parker Ranch. So there are um, planes that are equipped with crates and you know, dividers uh, for the shipment of cattle. And um, so they were pretty much set up for uh, accepting these donkeys and flying. It was just one flight, but it was a full flight. Uh, full fly. I love that. Yeah, I love you said the, the, the one of the largest cattle ranches. You know, when people think of Hawaii, they don't think of that many donkeys and cattle ranches and such. It's really, really, really neat to hear that. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of horses here. And a little... lot of horses. A lot of horses. Yeah, yeah. a lot it's of good trainers to ride. So hopefully, your uh, viewers will think about coming to Hawaii and going on a riding trip. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So so. So let's talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that Humane Society and you in particular do. What, 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 can you go into maybe, um, let's talk about the Miracle Horse. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, back in uh, 2006, the state of Illinois passed a law that banned the slaughter of horses for human consumption, which essentially shut down the one of the last remaining slaughter plants in the United States. Right. And um, at the time the law passed, of course, there were still horses in the pipeline. And on the day that it went into effect, there were actually horses standing in the Cavell slaughter plant in um, DeKalb, Illinois. And so one of the shippers contacted us and said, you know, I can't take these horses to slaughter and I can't afford to take them back to where they came from. Um, are you willing to take them off our hands? And we said, yeah, we worked out a deal with him and, you know, paid for some of his expenses. And um, there's about, I think there was about 40 or 50 horses uh, in his load. And uh, we were able to, you know, get our hands on them and gentle them. Some of them, unfortunately, had to be euthanized because they had been shipped long distances in these overcrowded trailers, which happens all too often still. Um, but we were able to save almost all of them and find good homes for them. So, I always say these were the last horses to walk into a slaughter plant in the United States and walk out alive. Oh my! And that's goodness. why we call them the miracle horses. They absolutely are. And it's so cool that you were able to to train them or or work with them and then get them rehomed. The majority of yeah. them. That's really cool. Absolutely. And something else that we worked uh, with Pat Pirelli on um, back in 2009, we, we named him our Humane Horseman of the Year. This is an award we've been giving out every year since 2008. So he was one of our first ones. Very um, cool. But he worked with us to help um, change the perception of rescue horses as you know being broken or unwanted or not usable. Because we know that's not the case. A lot of times Absolutely. they just you know, fall into the wrong hands or they're neglected, but we know that most of them, vast majority of them are good candidates for rehoming. They just need some time and handling and TLC. Right. So Pat um, invited us to be part of his tour stop uh, in 2009. In each of those venues, we sought out a local horse rescue and asked them to provide an adoptable horse, one that maybe had a little handling and training, but you know, also had some issues and needed some work. And at each of those tour stops, Pat made that horse sort of like the primary horse that he worked with. Isn't and each cool? and every one of them got adopted by, you know, a great Pirelli um, student and follower. So we really appreciated, not just for the nine or so horses it was that we, you know, were able to rehome, but for the message that he helped us spread among his you know, audience that uh, they should consider adoption because a lot of these horses um, are in the place they are through no fault of their own. They just need some TLC and some some work and health handling. Absolutely, absolutely. And it ripples, you know, when people see that, they'll do that. And and that's what's so cool about it. You know, we we um we had race horses as a kid and, and we would after they got through off the track, they would become our roping horse. After that, they became the, the kids' horses. And after that, they just kept having new jobs and, and they excelled sure. at every one and just became part of the family. So yeah. I love that, yeah. Yeah, we also formed the first and really only of its kind Horse Rescue Coalition, uh, the Homes for Horses Coalition. So there are over 500 members now all across the United States, um, but there was no um, entity to represent them, to bring them together, um, to help them share best practices and, and help professionalize them because Right. You know, a lot of people get into rescue because they love horses and they want to save horses, but they really don't know how to run a rescue as a business. And so we wanted ones that were really doing a great job at that a forum to show and help others, um, to, you know, become more professional. And so for several years, we've uh, we hosted um, an annual conference where we would have speakers come in and share best practices. And like I said, it's really helped to uh, increase of horses that the rescue community is able to adopt out. I, I love that so much. So if somebody's interested in that, maybe getting some extra education, or maybe they thought about rescuing a horse, they really don't know, how could they find you or where would they go to find that information? Well, they can go to our website, you know, humanesociety.org, and just do a search. Uh, we have a, a training program that um, Carter Ranch Horse puts on. And I think you know them. I think you might have had Trevor on your show at one point, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, they, um, about five or six years ago, we asked them to put together a training program for horse rescues. So it's mainly a virtual program where they show, you know, they submit videos that the rescues do. And, um, you know, Trevor talks through the issues that they may be having. And then 
Every month or so, they get together by video to monitor their progress, but the ones that stick with it are invited to a live in-person training clinic, um, and there's going to be one held in Orlando next month that I'll actually be attending. Very um, cool. But it's like a, a two-day um, hands-on so that th those folks can, you know, put to work what they've learned virtually and, and refine the, the skills that they've learned by being there in person with him. So. Um, we've helped over 3,000 horses find homes that went through this program over the last several years, and um, it's been really rewarding to see it grow, and we're always looking for more um, rescues to participate. So if there are any rescue operators um, in your viewership here, we'd love to have them join. And um, the name of the program is Forever Foundation, so you can Google HSUS Forever Foundation. I love that. Yes, yes, there is. There's a lot of people that rescue horses or want to rescue horses and they're afraid of the, the first step is easy, you know, rescuing the horse. The second step is where it gets, you walk out the next morning saying, what do I do? I love yeah. that you have the part to help it stick. And that's yeah. so important. Um, it's critical. It, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. I've worked because otherwise the rescue just becomes a sanctuary. You know, if they, if they don't have the time and the skills to put into that horse to make it adoptable, they turn into a sanctuary and sanctuaries get filled pretty fast. A absolutely, absolutely. And then you never really see the best of the horse. You know, you see the beauty of the horse, but there's so much more inside. You know, I work with so many clients that rescue a horse and 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 then it's now what? You know, right. and, and, and I love that y'all do that. That's such a, from a trainer, that's so important for people to see. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So so let's go back to Pat Pirelli real quick, and then we'll go to the Olympics. So we got two more just incredible stories. So I, I think I saw a picture of you and Pat Pirelli with elephants. Yes. Or an elephant. So what was that? Can you tell me a little, tell the audience about that? Sure. Well, at this Black Beauty Ranch that I mentioned in Texas, we have not just equines, but we have several dozen other species. Most of the animals there are from rescue situations, abusive situations. And um, this one elephant we had named Babe was there. She had been rescued from a, a roadside zoo and uh, or traveling circus, I think it was. And um, so we gave her a forever home there and she passed away in 2010. But before that, Pat made a tour of uh, Black Beauty Ranch with us. And uh, spent a couple of days with us down there and he wanted to meet the elephant. He, you know, worked with elephants, not trained them, but, you know, been around them in the past, I guess, and uh, wanted to meet Babe. And so I think the picture you're referring to is him, him and me feeding Babe. That's so cool. So, That's so cool. Yeah. So at the Black Beauty Ranch, is that open for people to go and tour? It's not open to the public all the time, but we do have days, um, like a couple of days a year where it's open for tours. Um, so again, you can just Google um, HSUS Black Beauty Ranch and there'll be information there. But it's not like um, a zoo or even a sanctuary that's open for regular visits because we want the animals to be able to sort of live, you know, in harmony and peace and not be, you know, prodded or <laughs> jeered at or whatever by, sure. um, by the public you know, every day. But um, we do have um, tours uh, a couple times a year. And we've got uh, everything from uh, tigers to chimpanzees and a whole bunch of different, you know, farm type animals. Um, many of them, like I said, rescued from zoos. We, I think we still have a one-armed kangaroo um, <laughs> that was a victim of a, you know, like a fake boxing uh, operation, kangaroo boxing operation. So it's a really neat place. It, you know, it's just very um, moving to be there. And uh, yeah. if anyone's interested, I would definitely encourage them to come when it is open to the public. Sounds great. And if people want to give to the ranch, is that are they able to do that and help support yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah, we're a 501c3, which means all donations are tax deductible. And there is a, a place on the site um, to go for donations. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, so and that's in Texas, right? Correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Murchison, Texas. Murchison, Texas. Out, outside of Tyler. Oh, okay. East Texas. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. So, so let's go back. Now we're going to go to the Olympics. So, the 2008 Olympics. What was your role in Hong Kong? Well, you may remember that back in the early, well, I guess, late 1990s, early 2000s, there were a lot of um, injuries, rotational falls in eventing. You know, the mm -hmm. cross country section of three day eventing, and it got to the point where it was pretty bad not just for the horses and the riders that, that were injured or killed, but 
you know, just for the reputation of the sport in, in general. And so um, they had a big summit down in Lexington, Kentucky, and we were invited to attend. You know, obviously we were very concerned about the equine welfare implications and, um, and we did attend and, you know, encouraged the sport to develop uh, methods of, you know, safeguarding their athletes, both equine and, and human. Things like, you know, frangible pins that allow the, the jumps to be break away rather than just have the horse do a rotational fall over them. And so 2008 was the first Olympics where some of these um, improvements were being put into place. And we were asked if we would like to attend and observe, you know, the, the games. Um, of course, you don't have, you know, too much in the way of uh, welfare concerns with jumping and dressage like you do potentially with, uh, with cross country and the three-day eventing. So we did go and we did uh, observe and provided some feedback. We did the same thing at the 2010 WEG in Lexington, Kentucky, because that was just two years after those Olympics and there were still things being put into place, you know, still injuries and, and fatalities, but things gradually being put into place. So we were there, you know, both to monitor and observe, but also to show that, you know, we support the efforts uh, of those progressive folks like David O'Connor and, and others uh, in the sport um, who were trying to, uh, you know, improve the welfare of the horses. It's wonderful. That's wonderful. And it's so good you mentioned his name too, you know, because there are so many leaders like David and like Pat Pirelli and that are trying to do the right thing, you know, and, yeah. and it does ripple, you know, we said that earlier and that's so important. Yes. Yeah. I believe he was just given a lifetime achievement award and I wish I could remember the association, but uh, it was well deserved. You know, he was the president of USDF for several years, as well as a, you know, top Olympic level um, equestrian. And um, he really did a lot uh, for the association and for the sport, I think. That's awesome. That's so, that's so cool. Scott will be right back with more. Hi, I'm Scott Knutson, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, heard on KCAA, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product. And we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to cowboyentrepreneur.shop. That's cowboyentrepreneur.shop. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code COWBOY on checkout. Remember, that's promo code COWBOY for an extra 10% off. Just go to CowboyEntrepreneur.shop to order your coffee today. Thank you for listening to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Scott will be right back with more. For more information on Scott Knudsen, the Cowboy Entrepreneur, visit us online at CowboyEntrepreneur.com. So, so I saw that you do donor trips to yes. Wyoming, Montana. Could you talk? And so I guess first, how do you become a donor and, and what level does it become where you're going on these cool trips with you? So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, we have donors that are, you know, everything from, you know, donate $10 a month on our website to donate millions of dollars. It all depends on, you know, their capacity and their you know, level of um, you know, passion for the, for the issues. Um, and you can give specifically to our equine program and the monies you know, donated will be earmarked specifically for, for those efforts. But uh, that tr those trips that you're talking about were, um, were basically there was a fee to, to come. You don't have to donate annually at a certain level or whatever, but there was a fee. 
And it, uh, part of it was tax deductible because it is a donation to the, you know, to the 501c3. And the rest just covered the, the expenses of you know, having people at a do grant. But uh, there's a great place called 7D Ranch in Cody, Wyoming. And uh, they were our host for those rides and beautiful um, mountain scenery in what I think are called the Absorki. Uh, it's spelled Absorka, but it's pronounced a little differently, uh, mountains. Um, and so uh, one of the senior members of the family there at 7D was uh, connected to a local group that was doing um, darting of mares on the McCullough Peaks herd management area, which isn't too far from Cody. Um, these are wild horses that are being managed by a group of volunteer ladies who go out and, um, and use a contraceptive drug called PZP, which HSUS happens to hold the EPA registration for. We helped develop the, the drug. Um, and what it does is makes mares uh, infertile, not permanently, but for a period of time, so that you can control the rate of population growth um, without having to do removals. Um, and that works in a lot of herd management areas around the country. Doesn't work in all of them. And so you know, there's other ways of uh, administering the drug to, uh, you know, to those mares on those other large herd management areas. But anyway, we were um, treated to a site visit to the McCullough Peaks herd and got to meet some of those um, darting ladies. And then we also went out to um, Prior Mountain in Montana. Um, some of your viewers may be familiar with The Cloud, a series mm -hmm. of um, uh, documentaries that were, have been done over the last several decades. And so the Prior Mountain herd is essentially Cloud's herd. That's where he came from. And um, you know, a lot of his offspring are there. Um, beautiful scenery again. Um, just great to be out in the wild and see these horses in their natural habitat being managed humanely. That's so that's so cool. The pictures are beautiful. And yeah. and it, it, any horse lover would just love to be, you know, horseback with you on there, you know, just, just looking at them in their natural environment. Yeah. yeah. So how do they manage such a large sanctuary, you know, with horses and the land? How do they do that? And you said darting and there's a group of ladies. I think that's already so cool. But how do you manage a large sanctuary like that? Well, it's actually a federal um, federal land herd management area. It's not a sanctuary per se. Um, okay. There are over a hundred of those around the country in the ten western states. Um, okay. Some of them are, as I said, just so huge that unfortunately you have to do gathers to get your hands on the the horses so that you can um, inject the mares with this vaccine. But some. Um, are smaller and um, the horses are more accessible. Some of them, the horses are, you know, pretty comfortable with people being around. They don't see us as predators. And so you can actually get out and almost walk amongst them. In fact, one picture I didn't send you was um, of one of our donors walking sort of within a few hundred yards, maybe only a hundred yards of the prior mountain herd. So it's just neat to be out there and know that they're not gonna run off. And once you find them now, you know, it's, it's still a big enough herd management area that you have to spend quite a bit of time finding them. But once we did, um, you know, they were very approachable and um, not fearful and just great to be out there. Beautiful country. How, what, and, how cool of a feeling is it to be a hundred yards away from something so majestic? Yeah, you know, that yeah. not very many humans have been that close to. That's amazing. That's right. Well, we were really glad to be able to give our, our, our donors that experience. That is awesome. So if somebody's interested in doing something like that, like the once in a lifetime trip, they just go to your website again, right? Yeah, they could contact me at uh, kdane, K-D-A-N-E, -E, at humanesociety.org. We don't have any trips planned, but that doesn't mean we couldn't plan one again in the future, especially now that you know, things are opening up again, uh, you right. know, even still in the grip of COVID, but not so much as we were in the last two years, right? Absolutely. Man, that's so cool. So so you've co-founded a lot of nonprofits. So what, what's your wisdom on nonprofits? How do you start one and how do you want, run one the correct way? You know, that the business part of it seems to, that's where I think a lot of people struggle. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to have a really good board. Um, and it can't just be family members, right? Absolutely. You, really want to, you want to bring people with different talents and skills and abilities, you know, financial savvy, um, you know, knowing uh, how to run a nonprofit governance. Um, it's a very important to have an accession plan so that, you know, if you die or whoever the, you know, the head of the nonprofit is, 
it doesn't die with them. You know, there's a, a plan for them, you know, for the nonprofit to continue. Um, but basically treating it, you know, like a business, even though it's not for profit, you want it to be uh, sustainable and you don't want to run it um, to the point where it's running into the ground and you're paying out of your pocket to maintain it, to, to keep sure. it going. And then, uh, you know, a big part of that is finding donors that believe in your cause and care about what you're doing and willing to open their wallets to, uh, you know, to support it. That's right. So That's right. whether it's, whether it's fundraisers, you know, uh, a lot of nonprofits were hit hard during the pandemic because they couldn't have gatherings. They couldn't have galas, you know, um, where a lot of their, their uh, fundraising came from, but galas are a great way, you know, to, uh, to raise funds, um, having experiences like our trail ride, um, trips to allow, you know, donors who care about your, your uh, mission to, get to know you and be in a fun environment, um, beautiful environment and have camaraderie with other like-minded individuals, right? I, I love it. Yeah. I think that's so smart to set it up the right way, set it up like a business. And that's my, whenever I'm speaking to somebody about an, set it up like a business, you know, and then go enjoy it. Cause if it's not set up the right way, you won't ever enjoy it. And, and, and uh, I think with social media too, it, it's helped so get the message out to your market. So you can put those horses they're supporting or you can put out whatever it is and they can yeah. watch it, you know, and that's um, build that relationship. Right. And that allows people who couldn't physically get out, you know, Absolutely. to your location or to an event um, to still be a part of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just yeah. like those pictures, I can't wait for people to watch the show and yeah. uh, just see how incredible it is. And it's just going to make you want to go do it. And uh, it's a powerful medium for sure. So let's talk about some of your nonprofits. What was the first nonprofit you, you started or created? Well, I co-founded a nonprofit that was dedicated to the protection and uh, preservation of the Tennessee walking horse and other gated breeds. So um, when I moved to Maryland from upstate New York back in 1987, um, I saw a lot of the abuse firsthand and didn't want to be a part of the industry if I wasn't doing something to help reform it, right? Right. Um, but I found it very difficult to do that within the existing breed structures because a lot of them were being run by people who were the problem, frankly, and part of the problem. So, so I and some other like-minded individuals got together and formed the first national um, group dedicated to not just the protection, but also the promotion of the sound, natural Tennessee walking horse and other gated breeds. And that just sort of mushroomed into, you know, um, horse shows, a horse show circuit and clinics and um, all kinds of things that really helped people who wanted to do it the right way to learn how and, uh, and then to show off their horses um, natural abilities uh, in a uh, environment with a level playing field. I love that. And Keith, can you explain to the audience and some will probably know and some might not. What, what's a gated horse? Gated horses are ones that uh, have a very smooth ride. They're basically doing a four beat gait, not a two beat gait. So there's no jumping, no bouncing and jarring. Um, right. The Tennessee walking horse is one of the smoothest breeds. There are others like um, Pasofinos and Peruvian Pasos and Missouri Fox Trotters and racking horses. And there's even an Icelandic horse. Um, that does a, I think five different um, gates, um, but they're all, they all have that common denominator of being very smooth to ride. Yeah, and beautiful to ride too. Just beautiful yeah. and smooth. They're just gorgeous animals for sure. Yeah. For sure. So, so let's talk about another one. What about, um, what's another one maybe that you did um, lately? Cause I know you're involved in so many. I know the audience will benefit from just you talking about your nonprofits and, and, and how to fix and how to help. I love that. What's uh, your latest nonprofit? Well, I was involved in the uh, formation of the Homes for Horses Coalition, which is a uh, nonprofit, although it doesn't bring in any revenue. We're not there to raise money. We don't have any um, you know, salaried people. It's all volunteers. Um, but it's basically there to help other nonprofits improve and professionalize. And uh, you know, we've got over 500 members that are working every day to to uh, rehome horses and put a better foundation on horses and uh, put more of them out into the community. Keith, that's all so awesome because it's, you're, you're doing it on such a large level, 500 is a big number. 
but you did that with the, um, you know, when you rescue a horse, you have the training after, and this is created to help people that start nonprofits to help them after. So I, I think that's so important to uh, get the second half of the book, so to speak. Yeah, we, I mean, we really want to help every horse that's, um, you know, able to, to find a good home. And we want to help the rescues do that. We want to you know, help them strengthen their capacity to do that. And we want to give them the training tools to be able to do it as efficiently and, and with a good foundation as possible. I love that, man. I love that so much. So you were a judge in, in horse shows and, and you, you, and you are. So, so what's your philosophy? Cause I know that's a tough job, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a tough job. So what's your philosophy for being a judge? Well, Scott, you know, I got into judging because I was seeing the wrong types of horses being rewarded. You know, right. a lot of artificiality and gimmicks and um, they were being rewarded for what the trainer could do to the horse, not do with the horse, not bring out of the horse. And my philosophy as a judge, particularly when you're talking about um, particular breeds, right? And this is gated breeds, Tennessee walkers and others, is to reward the horse's natural ability. Now, obviously, a trainer can bring that out and, and through a partnership, they can enhance it without force, without pain, without artificial gimmickry or things like that. And then that's my feeling of what should be rewarded. You have a standard that rewards the horse because the goal really should be to improve the breed, right? Right, abs you improve absolutely. The breed, you improve the breed through breeding, but if you're breeding horses based on a ribbon or a trophy or an award that was given not because of what the horse could do on its own, but what somebody could do to it, then you're you're rewarding the training. Absolutely. <laughs> you're, not improving, you're not improving the breed. So right. if you reward the horse's natural ability, each generation is going to get better and better. Absolutely. If you don't, then it's going to get worse and worse because it's going to be horses that are dependent on that gimmickry, that abuse or whatever. Uh, breeding to other horses like that and then you don't have a good foundation anymore so that's right. my philosophy you know and that's why I got into judging because I wanted to see the breed improve and the horses that were naturally talented be the ones that were most rewarded I, I love that man once again you, you find something that you, you that might, could be a problem and you go in and try and fix it make it better you know and that's what every horse person should do I love that so, so what do you see as a future of riders and, and, and trainers, owners in the industry, in the horse industry itself? Well, I think there's a great future for horse, horse ownership, horse riding. Um, I think that you know, COVID has been kind of a double-edged sword in some ways. Mm -hmm. you know, there were people, I was just reading an article this week, some people were spending more time with their horses because they couldn't get out and do other things. Yeah. Um, some people were not able to get their horses if they're boarding, you know, at a stable because there were some limits on, on their access to their horses. But I think what it has done is uh, increase people's appreciation for the time that they can spend with their horses. And we just need to get more people involved, you know, in the Absolutely. industry. And, um, you know, I know there are groups like American Horse Council and others that are working on that. I know that um, USEF has... Um, got a, a membership level that I don't think you even have to pay anything for. It's like a, a spectator level, but you know, you're still part of something, right? Yeah, Which absolutely. means that you're, you're getting information from them about you know, events and things like that. So I think you know, the industry has a great potential uh, to grow and, and thrive, um, but it's going to take people coming together and finding new outlets for horses because there are a lot fewer showers, shows than there were a few years ago. And I don't know that that number is ever going to come back to what it once was. So you got to find other outlets, whether it's, you know, judge trail rides or um, whatever, um, just new avenues for people to participate with their horses. In fact, for a, a few years, we were giving grants out to groups that were doing just that within the Tennessee walking horse industry, because we want to we want to encourage the people who are doing it right. So we were giving grants out for people who are doing like gated dressage clinics or um, you know, timed events or things like that, carriage driving events, just anything that's a little different than just going in the ring and going around in circles in two directions, you know? Yeah, that's cool that you all are doing grants. So how, how do we attract new, new people into the industry? 
how because I think that's that's so important to our industry stay you know to keep it vibrant keep it alive and new people bring new ideas you know we respect our past but we always want to get better as horsemen and 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 horsewomen so how do we attract more people like I said, having different types of events, making Absolutely. things interesting, um, doing things out of the box, not relying on the same old ways that we've always done things. And, you know, there are some um, great programs um, for like inner city youth uh, around the country that are, you know, popping up all over the country. Yes, um, and uh, that brings in a whole different, um, you know, group of people um, to the horse world than otherwise would have been there. And I think they've been overlooked and um, you know, they're gonna be part of the future too. I agree a hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's happening all over and it's so much, it's so fun because there's so much energy and there's so much passion, you yeah. know? And, and they wanna learn. And I, once again, I keep going back to social media and, and it's, there's some bad things about it for sure. But the good thing is they can go on your site and learn some of the training tips. There's other people like Pat Pirelli, you know, other people that have these opportunities for people to learn that maybe didn't grow up in the dirt and the sand like I did, you know, or, right. or ride like you did, you know, right. so. One of the things we encourage our, uh, you know, our rescue partners to do is to invite the public in and give them a chance to get to know a horse before they ever think of owning one, um, you know, volunteer, get, you know, get up close and personal with horses and see if it's something for you. So you don't have to feel intimidated like, I've got to go and learn how to ride right away. You can just get comfortable with a horse, you know. And there's a lot of other things that people can do besides riding horses. Like hundred percent agree. Yeah, like therapeutic riding and you know uh, liberty and all kinds of things that um, people are starting to explore now. Yeah, but, I love uh, that. I'm glad you said that because there is. You don't have to be a trainer to be in this industry. You can be a photographer. There's there's different ways to be in the industry to help the industry. Right. And, and I appreciate you saying that. So you have a relationship with horses. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. I'll tell you what, there's nothing better. Um, so what, what is that plaque back there? It's pretty nice. <laughs> um, this is an award we won last year for a, um, a video that we produced. It's the American Horse Publications. They have an annual uh, media awards contest. And we've been, as I said, um, sponsors of that group and their event for a number of years. And for the last several years, we've um, submitted entries into the contest in different categories and we usually um, place somewhere in there but I think we've won you know top prize in two or three different categories over the years so we're really proud to be a part of that organization and it's quite an honor to be um, you know a recipient of one of their top awards um, Absolutely. in fact last year I was uh, nominated and was a finalist in their um, equine industry vision award and I've been nominated again this year so we'll see how that works out at their event, but uh, that was really an honor. That's a big deal, Keith. Thank, congratulations on that. You know, I, nice. I, I I love. I'm a member of them as well. I really support what they do, and and uh, you know the, the the journalism part and the photography part, and and uh, how they promote our industry is wonderful. But yeah. to uh, be in the running for the Vision Award, that's a big deal. I agree. It was yeah. a real honor. Yeah, heck yeah. So so we were talking a little bit earlier before we started the show about Briar and the Briar horses and everything Stephanie and her team does. Um, yeah. Would you mind showing everyone who's watching the show today um, what's on your desk from Briar? Yeah, sure. So um, let me just back up and preface this. Yeah, bit. do it. Yeah, that's so for great. For many years as a kid growing up, I did Briar horses, as I'm sure many of your viewers did. And uh, even though I knew that there was something wrong with the, what we call the big lake or the high stepping Tennessee walking horses, I collected them in fact, I still have some of the models here in box <laughs> in my office. But um, several years ago, Breyer decided not to produce that artificial, you know, high stepping Tennessee walking horse model anymore. And now they've got one, this is a, a plastic green one. And it was, I think it was labeled under the sea because it was around the time of the Little Mermaid. But uh, anyway, they, you probably know when they make a model, they can change the color and the, the material that it's made of and everything over the years. But this is their new Tennessee walking horse. Gorgeous. It's the natural black Tennessee walking horse. So gorgeous. And, uh, yeah. You know, Briar has really um, been quietly behind the scenes, sort of a strong advocate for equine welfare. 
not only did they make this change in terms of the model that they use, but um, they've been a donor to the US um, wow. through their Briarfest event. Um, you know, they have a, an auction that raises funds for nonprofits, and they've been a regular donor to, to that. And uh, we're really grateful to, to Tony and Stephanie. Yeah, Stephanie does such a great job, you know, with, with Briar and her whole team. And, you know, when we mentioned the Briar Horses or American Horse Publications, American Horse Council, there's so many great groups within our industry that are supporting, supporting us and also leading some of the industry to be, you know, leading the uh, industry in the, in the right way. That's right. And Briar has really probably brought as many horse people into the industry as absolutely. Just about absolutely. The years, you know, these kids get into collecting and then they say, I want to have a horse. And that's you know, their first taste of um, any connection with a horse, right? Yeah. And you did, you've done some things with Briar Fist as well, I think is what you said. And yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, they have the lab, the lab horses there, the lab breeds, they have the model horses and kids get to see horses they've played with, you know, for the last two or three years. And now they're alive. And, and uh, they have, like you say, they've brought so many people into the industry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They do a great job. They do. I can tell you my daughter has several, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is wonderful. Uh -huh. Which is wonderful. So, so what's next for you? What's next for the Humane Society of the United States? Well, like I said, we're starting to open up again and go to more conferences and events. And, uh, you know, we're still trying to get these federal bills passed. That's my top priority right well, now. And uh, we're going to keep at it until we, until we succeed. A lot of what we do is just, you know, taking care of animals when they're in need. We have a, an animal rescue team. Uh, we've done some really large scale uh, rescues over the years, you know, a few hundred horses at a time. And a lot of times when there's a, a particularly like a neglect case, uh, large scale neglect, the local authorities just don't have the resources to go in and seize the horses and hold them while a course, you know, court case proceeds. And when they have that situation, a lot of times they'll contact us and ask us if we can help. And we do have a team that's, you know, uh, hundreds of people literally volunteers and staff um, that can deploy and um, you know if, if we're called if we're able to we send a team out and we'll keep those horses in place or move them to a local fairgrounds or whatever and provide care for them until you know, you know until the case is resolved and then help to help to find homes for them so right. those are the kinds of things we do day in and day out and um, a lot of people don't know about that but you know it's a, a big part of what we do to protect horses obviously in my realm my role is to protect thousands of horses over you know, decades by you know, getting public policy into place like that Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, which is right. gonna save thousands of horses' lives. Um, you know, we can save one horse at a time, but we also wanna save thousands of horses for the future. And that's a big part of what we do. Absolutely, man, that's really cool, man. Well, Keith, thank you for everything you do. I really appreciate being on the show and it was a pleasure to meet you up in Montana. and, and uh, I'm glad we finally got on the show together. Likewise, it's been great here and being here and great talking with you, Scott. Thank Looking you for next time. time. Yes, sir. Bye now. Thank you for watching the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Thank you to all the great sponsors of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. If you or your business is interested in being a sponsor of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, please call our office at 830 992 1786 or visit our website cowboyentrepreneur.com.